Um, this is Adam Jukes. <coughs> and um, delivering, as promised, rather belatedly, um, part two of my blog about the compulsion to repeat painful experiences. And this, this really will make very little sense to anybody who hasn't watched part one, in which I talked about the relationship between the desired object and the absent object and the dramas that people get into um, in order to change the absent object into the desired object. Um, and I'm going to, you can, you'll be able to tell I've had no design or graphics training <laughs> when you look at this. Um, this is basically the sort of, um, gosh, here we are. So there's the present object to which all of the default settings are attached. And I, when I, I use this word object, if you look at part one, to mean relationship uh, in talking about people, although the object can be anything, your career, your money, anything. Okay, but I'm talking um, explicitly about relationships here. So the present object is your present partner. And all of the pain and distress and whatever it is you feel in that relationship because it's not right and you want it to be different, I call the default settings and part one tells you about those default settings and how they, they've always been important to you. Almost trans-historical. Not that you were born with them, but that they were laid down in a, almost in a hardwired way when, when you were a child clearly, with um, powerful authority figures, parents in particular. And then there's the uh, desired object. Um, this, and, you know, the present object is unsatisfactory, and, be, and we, we compare the present object with the object we desire. And so that the, the, the present object, in a sense, um, contains the absent object, because the absent object is the desired object. And so between the present object and the default settings and the desired object, we get into lots and lots of dramas um, between, in that space there, between the present object and the desired object, pressuring them, manipulating them, getting into all sorts of dramas in order to make uh, the present object into the absent object, the absent object being the desired object. Now, um, the I did mention, I think, in the first um, video that, the, that there is another object, and, and the other object is the feared object. And the feared object is by far the most important in this model. And the question then, obviously, is, you know, um, what is the feared object? If people keep repeating these dramas with the present object in order to make the present object into the desired object, what precisely is the feared object? Because the dramas don't work, the dramas are intended to take us back to the default settings um, so that in a sense we operate in a state of false consciousness. We think we're behaving in the way that we're behaving in order either to persuade or bully or, in one way or another, make the present object into the desired object. But unconsciously, it's, it, it's intended to fail because there's a great deal of in the painful default settings. It's known territory. We not only have a map, we actually live in the territory. There's there are no surprises in there. However painful it is and distressing and anxiety-provoking, there are no surprises. The surprise... And one of the reasons why we engage in these dramas, and there are other reasons, and I'll get to them, but one of the reasons we engage in these dramas is in order, actually, to avoid facing the feared object. And what is this feared object? The feared object, to put it at its simplest, really is the present object towards whom we have all of these feelings, these default-setting feelings. So... Let's take a really simple example. If you, if you believe that your partner doesn't love you and you move heaven and earth in whatever your favorite ways are to get them to be somebody who loves you, of course, a lot of, the, a lot of that is underpinned by hope that this 
it, 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 it will actually work. It doesn't, but it's, obviously hope is a major player in, in, in the dynamics of the drama or dramas. But, but the, the really painful thing is to face the truth. The reality is that you feel that you're with somebody who doesn't love you. Now, what could the origins of those feelings be? It could be that you have an incapacity for feeling loved because it may be that your present object does actually love you, however inadequately they, they express it or however they behave always assuming that they're not actually acting in a hate, hateful and hating way. But so it could be that you have an incapacity and if you have, well, that's obviously quite a serious problem. Whatever it feels like to feel loved, clearly it's a fantasy structure. It's, a, it's something that exists between the ears, the capacity. And if you have a limitation in feeling loved, then you have to just deal with that and more, more than likely with a professional. Uh, who can actually unpack the origins of that. But, so the, but the, 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 the feared object is actually the object who doesn't love you. And, and, that's, and it's, it's facing the almost unbearable pain of that. Now that object who, who you imagine doesn't love you is an ancient object. And ancient in the sense of being part of your very early life, of your upbringing. And it may not even have been true that your mother or your father or both your parents didn't love you, but for all sorts of reasons, you've grown up with the idea that they didn't. And it's been repressed and adapted to in lots of ways, in the way that you attach to other people and so on. And eventually you end up choosing somebody who reminds you unconsciously and perhaps even consciously of the parents who didn't love you, somebody who's a bit withdrawn, avoidant, cold or whatever. But the, the, the real fear, the real fear is not of living, <coughs> excuse me, is not of living with an object who doesn't love you. The real fear is facing the pain of the truth of that. And so long as you have the hope that if you keep up the drama, you can make them love you, you can actually change them into the desired object. As long as you have that hope, then clearly life has a purpose. But if you decide to face the object who doesn't love you and, and, and really get to grips with who that is or was, and obviously I mean was, um, the, the, the sadness and the depression that that entails can be really quite devastating. And, and yet, I suppose the paradox is that in order to be emotionally mature, we have to have a capacity for facing depression and for facing depressive feelings, grief and sadness. Most of us are extremely uncomfortable with those feelings because they, they can feel and indeed are often so subverting of our identities. And most people who've had a parent, a loved parent die, maybe not even just a loved parent, but who've had a parent die will know just how subversive grief can be to, to one's identity. And you know, grief is a form of madness, as we all know. And so, you know, the, what, what, what I'm suggesting is that, that in order to stop the drama, in order to get away from the default settings, and the default settings are the feelings that we felt towards the original and now unconsciously feared object, that, that in order to reach maturity, if, if that's what we want to do, then we need to face the feared object. We actually have to come to terms that this, this feeling, these default settings, are things we've lived with all our lives. And it does require some, that can require some fairly deep digging, you know, some archaeology, for want of a better word. Um, so when one of the reasons for the drama is that it helps us to, and one of the major gains of the drama, in fact, not a secondary gain, one of the primary gains is it actually helps us to maintain internal psychological stability. And that psychological stability can be instability. That sounds quite oxymoronic, but a, a, a level of anxiety, sadness, stress, distress, whatever, can be a stable way of living. And, and, and people live like this. I mean, a great many people 
right? at least 40%, I believe, 40% of people who can't sustain, form or sustain secure attachments. So um, that's a major primary gain, the maintenance of psychological stability. But, but as I said earlier, there are other motives for, apart from hope, which you know, gives us some sense of a future and a sense of going on being. I, I do believe that it's not just masochism, although masochism is clearly important. Um, and I, when I say masochism, I mean moral masochism, not necessarily physical masochism, but the moral masochism that entails emotional suffering and guilt and all sorts of other things, anxiety. Um, and there are a lot of payoffs for masochism, and I will cover that much more deeply in another blog. But um, I do believe that another, another motive for this, this compulsion to repeat painful experiences, whether it's traumatic experiences or whether it's the ongoing drama of trying to change a partner who doesn't want to change, is that part of us actually really does want to face the feared object. That there's something, I believe, quite fundamental in all of us that, that pushes for psychological health and pushes for peace of mind and contentment, not happiness. I don't believe in happiness. doesn't mean I don't I think that we're not capable of happiness or feeling happy from time to time. But happiness as, a, as an ongoing state is chimerical. It, it's, it simply doesn't exist. No matter how many gurus tell you to stand on one leg chanting in a mirror, uh, will tell you it, 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 a state of happiness, it, it, a constant state of happiness is simply. Um, and, and I'm perfectly content to aim with my own patients and in my own life to reach uh, peace of mind. And peace of mind is a, uh, a state of mind in which you're not riven by conflict and not riven by anxiety. So I'd, anyway, to, to, get, to reiterate, I, I do believe that there is this fundamental drive towards health. And I think that, that, and of course, these objectives for the drama, the goals of the drama, both conscious and unconscious, are at odds with each other. You know, the, the, one, the one part of us that's pushing to, to face the feared object and have done with the default settings, literally have done with them so we can get peace of mind, is at odds with another part of us which is really scared of that because the feared object is feared for obvious reasons. You see, th there, there, is no, there is no experience of not being loved. There is no not in the unconscious. There is no no in the unconscious. So if there's no unconscious experience, then what is it that, the, that we do experience unconsciously in relation to the feared object? If it's not being loved, then it's obvious. It's, not, it's being hated. And it is the, a presumption that this object whom we construct as not loving us, which is not an experience, it's a construction, it's a symbolic construction, is, a, is a, if, if you like, a, a kind of rationale which helps us to avoid the, the real fear, which is to face the object who hates us and, and is presumed in extremis to want us dead. And this is not, it sounds crazy, but this is a very common experience. You know, anybody out there, especially anybody who sulks uh, or who splits, divides their present object into a loved object and a hated object, will know only too well that when you're in that state of mind where you think the object hates you and, and you hate the object and, and you think that they're actually deliberately inflicting pain on you, that's almost like a royal road to the unconscious experience of living with an object who you presume wants you, to, wants you dead. And, and facing that clearly is terrifying. And for an infant, having that experience, or even for a young child, a toddler, two, three years old, is obviously an idea. And, and, and infants don't have the cognitive capacities and the symbolic structures that would enable them to metabolize that and work it through. It takes real sophisticated cognitive structures to enable us to metabolize that kind of thought experience and to work it through and to grow through it. Um, so that's, that's the feared object. The, the feared object is is the present object whom, whom we simply will not accept it already exists inside us and of whom we are terrified. 
because we can't face the pain of the truth. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, and in my next uh, blog, I'm going to actually take up this whole issue of masochism because it's, it, there, are, there are many other gains from maintaining the drama and not facing the feared object. And, and, and masochistic gains, in my experience, are, are profoundly important, and, and I will address them explicitly in my next blog. I'm sorry for my graphics. I hope that they, I hope that they were at least uh, comprehensible. <laughs> um, well, I've enjoyed this, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed watching. See you soon.